Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Thank you. It is a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday morning out here in Amelia Island, guys. Today is Tuesday, May the 1st, 2018, and come Thursday, I'm going to have to start setting up for the festival, and right after that, I'm probably immediately going to have to leave to go back to Tennessee. So this is pretty close to the last day I'm going to have a chance to show you guys this. I really wanted to show you all this. I know I've done a lot of historic things recently, and it may be getting boring for some of you, but... Uh, the most historic thing out here on Amelia Island is this old fort called Fort Clinch. Hard to say because the word fort and the word clinch kind of run together when you say it fast. Fort Clinch. The fort has a history that goes back to 1847. Uh, over a hundred years ago in its own history reaches about, what is that, 98 years? So it started all the way back in the Civil War and it had active military use all the way up until World War II when it served as a outpost for horseback riders to monitor the beach for the landing of spies and so that was the last thing it was used for before it was turned into a national treasure in 1945. But a very long history, a very rich history and it is right through this door right here, and we're going to go out and see that soon. But before I do, they do have a museum here with a few things I would like to show you guys. First off, here is a replica of a Gatlin gun. I think it might be a replica. Actually, these, this looks pretty intricate for a replica. This might have actually been an active gun at one point. At any rate, uh, it was created by a Dr. Richards Gatlin, or Gatling, in uh, 1860. One. Now, you would think it's kind of odd for a doctor to invent a rapid-fire gun like this, uh, being as they are beholden to something called the Hippocratic Oath, where they do not willingly cause harm to anyone. Uh, but this doctor actually believed that a really effective weapon like this could make a battle much shorter, and the outcome determined a lot quicker, and therefore save lives. It's a little weird, his reasoning on that, but at any rate, we have the father of the modern machine gun here, the Gatlin gun. Right here, you can see all the different size cannonballs that were fired from different artilleries in the fort throughout the years. This one right here is the most interesting to me because it's hollow in the middle, making it break up. I'm, I think that might be called a mortar when it's done like that, but that's something you can see in a lot of these cases. You got. Uh, cannonball, hollow cannonball fragments here, and and then again over here. So that must have been something they used quite a bit. We got some actual clothing worn by some of the soldiers here, and this is something that always amazes me in these museums, is how fine the penmanship was back then. The written language was not so flippant. It was something that was really meant to be taken seriously and uh, for people to be able to understand it when they read it. We've got an old bone saw doctor's kit right here. Now these things were, I don't know if they really saved lives as much as they really put lives at risk with all the, uh, the insanitary practices they had back then. Then right through this room here where this rather noisy video keeps playing on a loop. Uh, against this wall, we've got another example of just how seriously they took their penmanship back then with this list of uh, sergeants. And you can see just how fine that pen penmanship was. Got a few uh, photos here from back when the fort was in its heyday and was uh, well armed. Here is probably the best visualization of, uh, the, of the fort. And with that, let's go on out and have a look at the real thing. And there it is. First thing you see when going into the tunnel that takes you into the, the fort are these, these sharp barricades. With these in place, it was impossible for a big troop to just line up and do a charge when these things were, were set up. And uh, there was no way for you to just like shoot a cannon accurately and take these things out and get them out of your way. They were, they were there to break up formations of armies that we're trying to get through a certain area, kind of like what we do with uh, rolls of barbed wire nowadays. All right, through the tunnel, 
into the middle of the fort now. Each one of these buildings is set up in a different way. I think one of them's an armory, one of them's a prison, one of them is a mess hall. I'm just gonna have to go into them one by one and let you guys see everything they've got here. The first one I'm going into, it looks like it's some kind of barracks. Uh, probably gonna be a lot of these out here. I mean, they had a lot of soldiers. Uh, did this. Oof, this looks barbaric. Man, look at these mattresses. I think they're full of straw. Well, you would have had to really have a lifetime of learning how to get comfortable and, and sleep on these things to really get any kind of good night's sleep on them. I mean, hard boards with a thin layer of straw. Times were rough back then. This next building looks like some kind of cooking area, and uh, there's even ashes here, like they must have done a live demonstration at some point. Kind of disappointed I missed that. There's your brick oven there. Even nowadays, the best pizzas are made in those things. Plenty of uh, cast iron cookware. That too is something that we still use today just because of how good it cooks. Sure is nice that they don't have a bunch of ropes cording all this stuff off where you're not able to touch it. It's nice of them to trust us a little bit. This part is kind of interesting that I just noticed. These lamps right here, it looks like the reservoir of oil was down in this little cylinder and uh, siphoned up through the wick right there and uh, suspended from a pulley. It goes all the way down to this handle right here. So you could raise and lower your lights, I guess, uh, according to how bright you wanted it right over your, right over your food. This pulley system here is part of what led to a lot of those old swashbuckling heroes that would grab a, a rope off the wall and slash it with their sword and then swing across the room. Looking at this now, though, I don't think that these pulleys and ropes could really hold the weight of a grown man. In the middle of the grounds here, you've got this neat little pump. It'd be fun to be able to pump it and see if any water would come out, but it's locked in place. And this is something I find a little interesting, this old-fashioned lock. It's got a, a tongue over the keyhole, uh, I'm guessing to protect it, so rainwater doesn't get in there quite as much and, and rust up your lock. That was a nice little innovation they had back then. This room here would appear to be the powder room. I say that because it's got tons of barrels of gunpowder here. I'm calling it gunpowder, but it says cannon powder on it. I wonder if there's a difference. Anyway, powder there, uh, time fuses here, and something called Hodgkin's cannon canister shot, three inch. Uh, back in the day though, I'm sure this ground would have been completely stacked to the ceiling full of gunpowder and shot, and there would be some safety precautions, a damp cloth or something over the door to make sure that nothing, no kind of burning ember can make it into this room. Got a second cooking area and dining area on the other side of the powder room, this time with the stove it looks like you're able to open it on your own. Oh cool, that's nice. Oh and a nice little window there so you can check the progress of whatever it is you're cooking. Huh, I wonder what this room was. Let's step on in here and see. Uh, there's a bench here with a hole in it. I wonder what that is for. It's the bog, the head, the can. They had to go, and this is where they went. Right beside the privy, there is this, uh, another armory. This time, it looks like it's for storing different size cannon shot. And this one has got a gate, a barred gate in front of it. It seems like if you're going to put a barred gate in front of anything, you should probably put it in front of the powder, not in front of the shot. Inside this room here, marked uh, Quartermaster, you've got a lot of really interesting things. Looks like a desk here where their engineer was probably designing improvements or reinforcements to the fort. Uh, looks like uh, some mail slots there for paperwork and mail call. Uh, a map of the area on this wall, and then the storerooms here for uniforms, canteens, shoes, all kinds of stuff that a army would be wearing out and using on a regular basis. And then another storeroom on the other side, this time for tools, digging instruments, things of that nature. And then you can even see through there more barrels of, well one of them is marked salt. So probably a lot of foodstuffs in there. Taking a second look at the flyer I got from the Welcome Center, 
the first war this was this fort was in was the Civil War, and it went on to be used in the Spanish-American War, and then World War II. So a lot of active military use, a lot of history here. This room right here comes complete with a chalkboard. I'm wondering if that was for some kind of school lessons, or maybe going over different strategies for whatever they were going to do next. Uh, but it's adjacent to this room right here where somebody had private quarters with their own table. So this is probably a more educated person over here. Oh, look at this nice little, looks like 12 by 12 private quarters for this person. He's even got a chair with a cushion on it. And a view through a window. His own candle chandelier. This guy was living the high life. You know what, I'm starting to think they just put these straw mattresses on every bed. This guy probably had a little better or something. Well, this room right here is locked tight, but no matter, there's a wide open window right here so you can get a good view of what it is they're trying to keep us out of. No, I'm not gonna crawl through the window. Uh, and you can kind of understand, this looks like a blacksmith shop, so with all the sharp metal tools and stuff that he's making in here, they wouldn't want just anybody coming in without the blacksmith there to do his demonstration. And then switching over to the other window right next to it. Uh, this shop looks like it's mostly for making wagon tongues, axles, and wagon wheels. That was actually a very complicated process. Looking through another window now, there's a bunch of barrels of flour over here, and then bread pans, and then right through this opening, a oven, where I'm sure they cooked lots of bread. I'm sure that was a, a big staple for the soldiers out here to, to have nice bread. Uh, these barrels remind me of something that I learned when I was in Williamsburg. The making of wooden barrels was a noble profession back then. If you could do the complicated job of uh, hand hewing out slats of wood and fitting them together watertight and making them so they could last for years and you could do it well, you were called a barrel cooper. They also had a name for the professionals that made wagon wheels. They were called wheelwrights, and that's right in that building right over there. So you can tell they really valued craftsmanship back then. If you could hand make something and make it well, it was a very honorable thing, and your reputation kind of hung on it. Another shot of the bakery over here with the uh, room with the barrels of flour on the other side. And then in this room, you've got a little something that you've always got to have when you have a bunch of rowdy men living together, and that is a place to lock them up and they get out of hand. This looks like uh, <laughs> you probably had to wear this sign that says drunkard across your neck for a while to shame you while you were in here. we have got another one of these locks with the flap, the tongue over the keyhole. And there's another jailhouse on the other side. What do we got in here? Oh man, this one's even got leg irons in it. Boy, whoever was in here must have done something really bad. Well, that pretty much does it for all the buildings inside the grounds. It's time for me now to go inside the ramparts here. The part that I'm going in is right here next to 16, and it's going down to number 6, which is the East Bastion. East, well, we'll figure out what it is once we get in there. So this is what a bastion is. It's a place where you can put cannons sticking through the walls and fire at your enemies. Of course, during the heat of battle, this is probably about the most miserable place to be in the world. But, that doesn't interest me quite as much as this spiral staircase going up in this narrow passage here. I have got to go up there and see what's up there. Okay. Huh, look at that, I'm on top of the walls now. Oh, dangerous stay off walls. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, there's the entrance with those big sharp barricades I was talking about when I came in. And that tunnel goes from there, underneath the rampart, and into the grounds right there. And panning around here, there's all the cannons. Just came back down the steps into this bastion. Uh, I'm kind of curious as to what is inside this door now. So let's go in there. I'm gonna guess it's just a place for more cannonballs and gunpowder. It's just a big brick room. Probably was a place to store more gunpowder and cannonballs. Oh, and look at this. Going back out, instead of going down the tunnel, you can make a turn here and go out onto the rampart. 
go up these stairs and go sit on the cannons. So let's go do that. And just like that, I'm sitting on one of the cannons. <laughs> Looking at it from this side though, it's actually a lot more complicated than it looks. Because they've got a crescent shaped track right here with a bunch of numbers on it that probably correspond with the compass degrees for helping them aim at ships coming in. And there are a lot more metal tracks than there are cannons out here. If you can imagine back in the day, every single one of these tracks mounted with a cannon like this one, and then trying to be a two or three mass ship, trying to make it into port and invade this, this fort, you would have had a fight on your hands. It's actually pretty cool going through these tunnels. I'm betting this was the desired place to be during those hot summer days that out here in your military uniform. Because in these tunnels, you kind of take advantage of the, the temperature of the earth packed in around the bricks. It's the same reason why it's always cool inside of a cave. Inside of number four now, that is the uh, Northwest Bastion. Uh, it looks pretty much the same as the other one, only without all the cannons here. Um, to the right side of the room, there is a window here going out to this ancient 18th century extension cord and scaffolding. It actually looks a lot like the ones we use in our construction nowadays. At any rate, this one also comes with its own narrow corridor with spiral staircase. So I'm going to go on up there, the top of this wall as well. Ah, okay, now this one's got a mount for a cannon right here that could go 360 degrees. This must have been a really deadly one right here. Of course, why would you want to shoot back at your own guys anyway? Whatever, the option was there if they wanted it. I'm going out the tunnel of the fort now, guys. That's going to be it for today, but there is one last thing I wanted to show you guys. On my way out, I noticed that this fort actually did have a drawbridge. I'm not sure exactly how it was drawn up. Uh, the chain attaches right there, goes up to this axle here, and you can see a sprocket over there, and the chain coming down to this area right here. But I'm not exactly sure how they would raise it up, but it could be raised. And then there was a second layer of security with these doors that could be barricaded in place. So when they decided to lock it down, they could lock it down good. Well, like I said, this might be my last chance to really do anything fun out here in Florida before I have to get real busy this weekend and then head straight back to Tennessee. So I figured, why not jump in the ocean one last time? Hey, I've already paid admission to this nice state park out here, so I'm at Atlantic Beach. I'm gonna go enjoy this nice salt water. much fun. Whew, I feel invigorated. I'm at Whataburger right now getting myself a nice healthy lunch. Just noticed this and thought I had to turn the camera on to show it to you guys. We've got a laptop here that is plugged in. Where is it plugged in? It's plugged in the ceiling. I have never seen that inside the camper now guys and we are going on minute number 19 so I'm gonna have to draw this one to a close rather quickly now something that has been on my mind recently is that we are on episode number 87 now so we are rapidly coming up on episode 100 and I wanted to do something special for the 100th episode uh, I could just do a highlights reel where I take all the really cool moments and just jam them all together and make that into episode 100 but honestly, I wanted to save that till the one year anniversary. I wanted to try to think of something a little more creative for episode 100. And after tossing the idea back and forth uh, with some friends over text, we came up with five really cool ideas. 
And somebody had the idea, I think it was Danielle, had the idea of just letting you guys vote on which one you would like to see for episode 100. And I think that's a great idea. So uh, we're at 20 minutes, at, yeah, 20 minutes now. I know the people still watching are people that actually watch my videos. So you guys will decide what you will see on episode 100. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is put in a single number, the number that corresponds with the idea that you would like to see and the majority wins. So type in number one if you would like to see a funny sign uh, compilation. And that just means I go back through all my vlogs and find all the funny signs. Think the Fu King Chinese restaurant, all of those like that. And I will put them all together into a video. So type number one for that. Number two is a top ten low moments. And low is one of my very best friends. Uh, people say I'm adventurous. Man, this girl is so much fun and always on the go, a lot more adventurous than I am. If she ever started a vlog of her own, she would just pass me up and have tons more subscribers than me in no time at all, and I would subscribe to her. Just a few videos that she has been in on my vlog, I could go back and find the top 10 moments with her, and that would make for a wonderful video. Uh, number three is I Draw My Life, and if you don't know what that is, just type it into YouTube. There's been tons of really good ones made out there. I was thinking I might need to get a few more subscribers before I do this, but if you guys decide you want to see it, I will make it. Number four is, and I'm not sure exactly why, I've never had this idea before. I think Danielle came up with this idea. If I don't do this for vlog number 100, I will end up doing it at some point. And that is, I do a talking video talking about all the funniest moments that I've had while working. And that means, like, really weird uh, theme caricature requests and things that I've seen happen. Uh, I've got some stories. <laughs> and the last one is, if you would like to see a compilation of all the weird foods that I've eaten. Think of uh, the alligator tail kebabs and just recently the onion cobbler. All of those put together into a single video. You know what, now that I think of it, I didn't eat anything weird for this episode. Whatever. So that's it, you guys. One, two, three, four, or five. You decide what you want to see for episode 100. That is it. I love you guys. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already and hit the bell icon to receive notifications. Leave comments, leave questions, leave suggestions, leave your votes. I love you guys and I will see you again in the next video.